This is a dramatic reading of Time in Bed with Space, a blog by the stand-up physicist available at science2.0.com. Warning. This blog contains adult language and thermodynamics. If you are under 18 years of age or do not like laws that involve chaos, please leave by clicking on one of the websites linked here to support the site. Time and space are joined at the hip. I mean this in a completely naked, having an incredible animalistic time together kind of way. And I will review the history of physics to support this scandalous claim. Sir Isaac Newton developed the mathematics of change, the calculus. In looking at the logical structure of the formalism, he concluded that the math treated time as absolute and space as absolute. He was not happy with this result, but logic is logic. As a person, Newton was not known for being a nice guy. He and God were on the same level, far above the commoner and the counterfeiter. One rumor that has lasted throughout the ages is that he died a virgin. Now at 18, at MIT, I had the choice, you know. I had never actually kissed a girl and I was wondering should I follow Newton's footsteps? Well, I chose to become a biologist because I know they at least study sex. In 1905, Einstein found a link between time and space. Not being a diligent math student, it took his professor, Minkowski, to recognize that the Lorentz transformation was a rotation of time into space and space into time. The party between time and space was just beginning. Like an exclusive nightclub, the fun was restricted to jet setters traveling at very high speeds in very straight lines. After 10 years of effort and a lot of hard work, time was allowed to mix in any way with space using the Riemann curvature tensor. Toiling on the Russian front, Karl Schwarzschild solved, these, com, the, solved the comparatively simple case of a spherically symmetric, non-rotating, uncharged source mass. Uh, and it also had to be not rotating. I said that. Sorry. All right. But anyway, good going, Karl. But he actually died on the front due to a nasty autoimmune disease. Finding new solutions is rare. The math is even hard today, even though we have supercomputers. Einstein had better skills with the ladies. At ETH Zurich, there was one woman in all of his physics classes, and she got pregnant with his child, and then, well, wasn't, but they did get married and had two children. He got a great job in Berlin, and she stayed in Zurich. Long distance relationships didn't work back then, and uh, they're not so good now. He decided to remarry his first cousin, but don't worry, they had no children. They were together during his superstar years. The 1919 New York 
Times article on the light bending around the sun. Oh, I've got a copy right here. Okay. It says, and i quoting here, light all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over the results. I love this paper. You know, it's got Lady Astor in there and another bits of trivia from 1919. November, I believe. All right. And it's framed. It's in my living room. Hope you've got the same thing in your living room. He finally got the Nobel Prize in 1921. And it had to be really scary to be in Germany, um, particularly for someone of his ancestry. And he finally came to America, had a nice visit out at Caltech, uh, but decided to set up shop at Princeton. Again, this is just a rumor, but I heard that after the missus passed away, he had a room for entertaining female friends. The Russians sent a lady spy after the old man. <laughs> and while she did get into the room, uh, I don't know how many secrets uh, about the Manhattan Project she was able to obtain. Now, I am a radical anti-Newtonianist. I think that's a new word. <laughs> I will never allow time to separate from space. Likewise, I never allow energy to be separated from momentum. Surely I must be joking, Mr. Stand-Up Physicist. <laughs> I mean, take Newton's second law. I mean, that's all you need to figure out bowling. And nothing travels that quickly, even if you're professional. But how do you know that it's classical physics? Say you were in a bar and you were pretty drunk. Like, you probably shouldn't stand up kind of drunk, okay? And someone, someone slaps down a a napkin next to you. If I can find the, I'm, I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble here. Yes, a napkin uh, next to you. And they say, which one of these equations is classical physics? And which one of these equations is relativistic quantum mechanics? Well, this is a weird bar. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but if you've looked through like tens of thousands of books on Newton, well, it's never written this way. You know, really being dimensionless, really being dimensionless, is like smoking much better dope than they're used to. Thought you knew what high was, uh, but it is just not so. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my focus. Uh, it happens. It happens when you drink. Okay, um, but the classical equation is the one with all the Easter eggs. There's one, two, three, four zeros there. It's like everybody's partnered with a zero, a loser. <laughs> so I could tell the difference. That's good, even if I was drunk. The absolute separation of time and space is apparent when all the zeros are written out explicitly. Newton took the correct first step. It is the relativistic quantum field theory that has tried to fill in all the slots. That would be equation number two. And in fact, the scalar operator in equation two is known as the Klein-Gordon equation. Anyone reading this blog know the name of the lady three-vector equation curled up beside KG? Celtics fans want to know. Now, time and space actually get really kinky in relativistic quantum field theory. Something that I know few of you have probably ever studied. 
The Dirac equation introduces the dance of the 16 Dirac gamma matrices. There are a bunch of relationships between these gammas that make for a good test of your skills in abstract algebra. The high priesthood can talk about the different types of representations and their implications. Not that anybody understands what they're saying. Now let me ask you a much more working class kind of question. What the fuck does one of these Dirac matrices do? So let's just look at gamma 1. Oh, I also want a napkin. Looks just like that. All right. So this shows up playing spin the spinner games inside the Dirac equation. That's still way too complicated. So let's think about what this would do to Joe event in space time and see what happens to that. So you've got this gamma one, you hit it with a T X Y Z and what you get out is a Z Y minus T minus X minus T. Hmm. Now the Z position is literally time. Let that bother you, it should. The value of time is looking into its past so it now can point along the Z axis. X and Y switch their gender roles and X is not happy with it, it shows up with a minus sign. There are 16 Dirac matrices. Uh, so information is systematically scrambled up. This is how Feynman's sum over all possible history happens. Go Gamma, go girl! <laughs> There are now these two extremes. Newton's purely classical world with zeros for every young man to guarantee that he remains chaste. KG, he knows how to throw a fully relativistic field theory party so that no one cares who they end up with or what role they take. Uh, there must be something in between these two extremes. There is. It is classical quantum mechanics. It looks a lot like actually the Klein-Gordon, but changes in time are not so crazy. In fact, you only need one time derivative. So one full four vector vector derivative is the same uh, replica of what is found uh, in Klein-Gordon, which has actually two of them. The other operator has a constant one in place of the partial derivative with respect to time, the time derivative. To make the spatial derivative dimensionless, it needs a factor of h-bar over 2m. The mass shows up as a number instead of an energy three momentum quartet because that of that constant factor of time. So drop that all in and you'll get uh, Schrodinger's equation out of it. All right? Wow, oh, is, is this the one? Oh my goodness. I don't know if I should show this. That has a lot of information. All right, well anyway, some will say that it's silly to have the same collection of constants on both sides of this equation, I am playing hardball against nature. It's on her court with her rules. I mean, I recognize the importance of algebra, you know, and I have a great imagination, but I cannot see nature using anything but naked numbers. I will openly ignore the convention that Sch uh, Schrodinger used in the first place. I'm going to have an art sidebar timeout sort of thing. Okay, I have this idea 
for a poster. It features some dimensionless equations. The GEM uni Unified Standard Model Equations, the Certainty and Uncertainty Principle, Schrodinger, and Klein-Gordon. The alliteration Nature Nurtures Naked Numbers will be there in nice bold text. And I need one more element, and that is an image of a naked woman. As I understand it, there are a few places on the internet that have these sorts of images. Uh, but I was hoping to get someone who is familiar with some of these equations, so there was actually a tangible connection. I, I don't care if it takes me years to find such a well-educated model, uh, since, you know, I actually work on long time scales. All right, our timeout is over. Others might say that I should just use natural units, which have every one of these guys equal to one. The H, the C, the G. But it's so easy to get really lost playing in the world of physics equations. I cling to my physical constants. I like seeing one H bar next to that time operator and two next to the you know, del squared sort of thing. Um, and I like that there are no C's in the scalar term that ends up being the Schrodinger equation, and yet there are some C's in that three vector sort of expression. And again, I ask the question, who is that equation in the three bed lying next to Sch Sch Schrodinger? It has the same operators, just in different combinations. Nature's got to use that kind of stuff, that kind of information. And as a matter of fact, there's probably people who know how to do that. And if you can tell me what that kind of body of work is, uh, I would appreciate it. So now we're going to move on to one of the great remaining mysteries in physics, the source of asymmetry in the second law of thermodynamics, the proverbial arrow of time. It may have been Ludwig Boltzmann himself who pointed out that the asymmetry was kind of put in by hand. Now, once it's there, everything is fine. I did struggle through a modern interpretation uh, written by Hugh Price, uh, Time's Arrow and Archimedes' Point, New Directions in the Physics of Time. And he really sees no reason that for that asymmetry. And he does go after people who've claimed it has already been resolved and puts up a really good fight, saying, not so fast, sailor. Actually, Price is an idea smith, so his critiques are far more sophisticated uh, than I can do with my sock puppet prose. The Foundational Institute... No, no, sorry, I got it wrong. The Foundational Questions Institute, FQXI, sponsored a contest called The Nature of Time, which was won by Julian Barber, who had a well-titled submission, The Nature of Time. <laughs> the only contestant with that much moxie. These good FQXI folks apparently ignored my own contest done in March of 1996, posted to the news group Psy Physics Research. Here were the rules as I outlined them. Please email me, sweetser at world.sdd.com, your favorite definition of time. There are only two constraints. It must be based on mathematics or physics, not philosophy. And it must be two sentences or less. The results were reported on April 23 after a month of submissions. And the URL to find it, I believe, is uh, http colon slash slash bit dot li ly slash define dash time. 
It was this very contest over a decade and a half ago that got me to reject time by itself and to give space-time a full bear hug using quaternions. Always, consistently, like shut up already, you bore me. For the issue at hand in thermodynamics, it means that the question of the arrow of time is not well formed. I am borrowing a notion of a well-formed question by reading and rereading Gödel's proof by Nagel and Newman. What does one plus equal? Well, since it is not a well-formed question when mapped to math, the inquiry can never be answered. Should anyone provide me a definition of time, even have an experimental setup to show that definition in practice, I will watch from a cosmic ray. And then all the data will look like data of time and space. The definition of time looks to jet setters like the definition of space time. Hello? This is basic vanilla special relativity. Now, I know the august group that submitted essays longer than two sentences to FQXI knows special relativity. They are just following a long cultural tradition and will be stuck with the Boltzmann arrow of time issue. The essays do actually bring up other vital topics like how to measure it, anything let alone time. And so they are worth a read, as long as you carry uh, this, this cynical perspective or skeptical perspective on, on, on their ability to even uh, get at the heart of the issue. So does space-time have an arrow? Well, time, the time part, that's a scalar. And scalars have no pointiness. They never have. They never will. Space. Space is pointy. <laughs> and if you wish to get technical, uh, involve the snarky puzzle at the end. The two most important laws in physics today are the standard model and general relativity. And they are both local, depending on T x, y, and z. Might as well make time reversal local too. So thank you for watching this show and please deposit the global Lorentz transformation in the waste receptacles on your way out. As to my own sexuality, it's something that I know very little about. I do take as many adult adult ed classes as I can. Such information can be used soon after class to positive effect. I have received instruction from both Carol Queen and Tristan Terramino. Miss Terramino is the only teacher I know to show up in a short, form-fitting, bright yellow latex dress. <clears throat> They both have wonderful books out. This one is Carol Queen. One of her books, Exhibitionism for the Shy. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is uh, by Tristan. It's a Pucker Up. Hmm. Subtitle, A Hands-On Guide to Ecstatic Sex. Hmm. Yeah. Let's, should we read this instead of listening to me talk about physics? No, no, let's put that down. Sorry. Oh, and um, and though I uh, have not met uh, this uh, Ian Kerner, Ph.D. Okay, um, here's here's one for you. Okay, um, th she comes first. The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman. 
uh, this is going to get a uh, thinking man thinking and hopefully taking the correct line of action. So now, now for that, that stuff, we're going to go on to a snarky puzzle. So consider an event in space-time T, X, Y, Z in good old Carnesian coordinates so you don't have to think too hard. Uh, the first thing is show how this particular member of the Lorenz group, it goes, it's on the diagonal, it goes minus one, 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 okay? How that particular matrix would take the four vector into another four vector where only time had flip sign, no matter if time was positive or negative. Hmm. Wow. So take that new vector that you just created and apply the same matrix to it and show that it's like back to where it started. Now I want you to repeat this 1729 times and then admit that you took the shortcut of induction and uh, did not complete the letter of the assignment. But you know I think nature really works that way. Nature doesn't cheat. She doesn't do induction. She really does it. So, what I want you to now do is to define a vector, four vector, R. And I bestow upon you the power to multiply two four vectors together. A power you actually already had, Dorothy. Just find the R such that T X Y Z R equals minus T X Y Z. So there can be no doubt that such an R exists since quaternions are a mathematical field. The results should look so complicated that the weak will leave the room. Let them go. Show how, if the scalar is like 10 orders of magnitude bigger than these weeny little three vectors, which actually happens in classical physics all the time, then to a wonderful approximation, r equals minus 1, 0, 0, 0. And maybe the week will return because the minus one is like so easy they can even memorize it. Notice that the R is not a member of the proud Lorentz group. If the three vector is like so tiny you can ignore it then flip sign by just multiplying it by minus one. And that is an approximation whose flaw becomes obvious when you're dealing with 10 to the 23rd atoms. The arrow of space-time is obvious to my own child. So it should be obvious to physicists too. Thank you very much.